I'll call to order the Compensation Committee. Can we have a roll, please? For the State Controller, Ms. Paquin. Here. Mr. Rosensteel. Here. Mr. Keeley. Here. Ms. Vargas. Here. Chairperson Dillon, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. Our first action item is approval of the committee agenda and work plan. I entertain a motion. So moved. Second. All right, it's been moved by Harry, seconded by Lynn, uh, to approve our committee agenda and work plan. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. Any abstentions? That's been approved. Our next item is our minutes. Entertain a motion to approve our minutes. All right, it's been moved by Lynn, seconded by Nora. Give you just a couple minutes in case you need to scan those again. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed nay. Any abstentions? And the minutes have passed. So Melissa, we're going to turn this over to you for item number three. Okay. So this item is bringing back to the committee options to consider for the uh, quantitative qualitative weightings for the COO, Chief Operating Officer, and the Chief Financial Officer positions. If you recall at your April meeting, you adopted maximum incentive opportunities for the COO and CFO, specifically 20% for the 17-18 uh, fiscal year, 25% for the 18-19 um, fiscal year, and then 30% thereafter. The committee did request um, at the April meeting that staff return with recommendations for setting the quantitative and qualitative weightings for these positions. So staff went ahead and reviewed the current incentive structure for other eligible positions in the incentive plan, as well as opinion letters that have been provided by uh, Luis Navis, your primary compensation strategist uh, with GGA. Attachment one, um, which is comp 12, uh, shows all of the incentive eligible um, positions, incentive weightings with the COO and the CFO options highlighted. Staff did take into consideration, uh, you'll see there towards the very bottom, the Chief Operating Investment Officer um, quantitative weighting, uh, as well as the CEO uh, quantitative weighting, sort of as guidepost for arriving at the recommended options. On Comp 10, you'll also notice that the CEO incentive weightings are depicted along with the uh, options for these two positions, option one and option two, which I'll just highlight the quantitative weighting. Um, option one is 15% and then option two is uh, 20%. Uh, also included in the item is a description. It's kind of a summary of uh, the responsibility for both of these positions uh, that the committee may want to consider if uh, they want to um, uh, apply different weightings um, for the qualitative or quantitative weightings. Also attached for your reference is uh, GGA's opinion letter on the item, on the recommended options, and uh, we're asking that the committee adopt one of the options, and with that I'll hand it back to the committee for any questions. All right, um, uh, Melissa, it's, and you might have said this and I was Temporarily not paying attention. Um, they don't necessarily have to be the same either. They can be different for either position, correct? Correct. Thank you. All right, are there any questions? And, and I will highlight in uh, GGA's memo, uh, he did um, make mention of a qualitative difference that the committee may want to consider um, with the long-term uh, strategic um, qualitative um, factor. All right. Paul? information on incentive weightings in the um, investment division. This, this, the action item is just on the CFO and C Correct. COO? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that's because we're going to be taking a look at the whole incentive structure moving forward into our work plan next year. Okay. And we've got to get the two positions set up. We actually have to do an actual uh, selection process. We, we have to go through the whole thing to get them set up. Mm -hmm. So why, um, 
This is kind of more of a, a general question, and, and I, I guess uh, Luis isn't here today. No, he's not. Uh, why? Why do we? Why do we? Why do we, as the board, set up such a detailed incentive compensation structure? And it se seems to me that there, there are two people who report to the to the board: the CEO and the CIO. Mm -hmm. And um, we don't have day to day. Um, dealings with the staff that report to Jack and the staff that report to Chris. And so why why don't we leave it up to them to make a decision about incentive compensation for everybody who reports to them? Mm -hmm. Within the board establishing one big pot, and then we leave it up to them because they're the ones who know what we want accomplished. They're the ones who are the only ones who are responsible to us for accomplishing it. Yeah. That that actually was presented, I think it was September when we talked about delegating additional authorities to the CEO. And this particular the incentive weighting component of it was it was requested that it still stay at the committee level for those determinations. So uh, um, if so that was a decision made by the committee. Yes. So September yeah, I, I think it was September. I can't remember when it was. April of last year. April. Yeah. So again. So April fifteen. Sixteen. Sixteen. Yes, sixteen. Sorry. Right. And that was made. That was a decision made ju just with respect to these two positions. Um, no, it, no. It, I think it was, it was the whole, with the whole regards to program. those positions that report up to the CEO um, and to all, all of and them. the investment positions. Yes. To all of the positions. Yes. Separate from the CIO and the CEO, of course. And Paul, I think certainly as, as we take a look at the incentive program, I mean, that's probably a worthwhile conversation to have to see if the committee and the board still feel that way. Yeah, because I'll tell you, the, reading, reading the materials this time, both the materials here and, and the materials in the investment committee, I, I started feeling like, like we, were, we were asking to become experts down in the weeds where I'm certainly not an expert. Um, and I'm not sure that it that it works the right way for, um, you know, I want I want Chris to 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 get the the returns we want out of investments, and and uh, I, I don't I'm not sure that m the board telling him how he should pay his people um, is the best way to get him to incentivize his people to do that. So yeah. that's, and the, I, and I think the other that thing would I be a good question to to discuss. The other thing I do recall, and perhaps, and this is why it's being presented, is um, the committee's desire to add a quantitative piece to it, mm -hmm. and what did that look like? And rather than dive into it at the last meeting, it was decided let's we let's bring it back this time off to this meeting. So there is that um, change uh, with adding the quantitative um, to the total fund to kind of reflect that executive team um, that I'm support. Yeah, that, yeah. I, I'm, if I'm. Maybe I'm not making myself clear of that one. I, that I'm completely in favor of, okay. right? I mean, I'm in, I'm completely in favor of, of, of a substantial amount of incentive compensation for everybody in the organization being a function of how successful the organization as a whole is. So. Okay. All right. Jerry, and I probably should have introduced Jerry. This Jerry Gleiser Hendrick is here as a representative of the treasurer, correct? Correct. Whew. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. I just wanted to raise the question of whether or not um, the uh, quantitative measures for the COO and the CFO should should be the same um, to the extent the CFO is, is more on the front lines with regard to returns to the portfolio. Does it make sense to bifurcate the the compensation options for the COO and the CFO to weight the CFO's compensation more um, with regard to the total portfolio fund return and more um, quantitative measures. All right. Is there? Go ahead, Harry. I, I was hoping that staff would yeah. respond to that. Um, that yeah. Part. That's definitely, um, there's flexibility with making um, that change relative to having the CFO um, perhaps have a different weighting to the total fund. Uh, 
so 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 that is an option for the committee to consider. Um, in the in the description, the CFO does have kind of um, very close connection with um, our CIO relative to the um, um, financial um, information there that she's managing. So, we're looking for. Jerry, did you have anything more? else you wanted to add? Okay, Harry. Thanks, Madam Chair. I just wanted to be sure that I understood uh, Ms. Uh, Glazer Hedrick's question. It was along the lines that the CFO um, compensation, uh, a higher percentage would be for the total funds performance. And can you just talk me through again your thinking on that? more direct oversight with regard to managing the funds um, and directly overseeing the returns. The, the, the COO, while that's an important function of their job as well, has, has other functions. And the idea was potentially just to, just to wait the um, CFOs, um, to wait that more mm -hmm. um, significantly for the CFO given their roles and responsibilities within the organization. Here. Okay, uh, that's helpful. Um, is, is there anybody on staff that has a different view on that or um, uh, has some further insights into it? I, it I seems can, reasonable, but I, I might. Yeah, I'll be glad to wait. No, I would, I would agree in a theoretical construct that yeah. absolutely the CFO's position, our entire investment accounting operation is under the CFO. And in fact, uh, although we've made some changes now in classifications, we've even had investment officer classifications within the CFO's uh, responsibilities at times. So the linkage is, and obviously the CFO is responsible for our financial statements, which involve enormous issues around valuation of investment transactions, et cetera. So there's a, a much more direct tie to the CFO. The box you're in, I would say, I just want to make sure you, you all saw the sentence in the write-up, is that the CO. I owe uh, the invest in the in, in the investment branch. Deborah Smith's position has a twenty percent quantitative component to it, and obviously that position is lives and breathes the investment operation every day, and everyone's dependent upon that position for success in investments. So it wouldn't make sense to me at all to, to have these two positions at. At that, I mean, if, if it's twenty percent for that position, I, you'd want. I think you'd want to be somewhat under that, mm -hmm. but it, it makes sense to Jerry's comment that there be the differential right. makes sense to me. I liked personally. I thought mm -hmm. Luis's comment made sense to me, which would be put a little more weight in the CFO and put a little more weight on the COO on the COO's position on long term planning. Because that that person, and as you know, Cassandra is, is our, our, has chief oversight over our technology project. If you think of those things and the long-term success of CalSTRS, it, it screams out of the strategic plan. So I thought his uh, perspectives was, was good. The problem is getting the numbers right because you've got that uh, comparative disadvantage there with the COIO position on the chart. It's a smaller bonus to work with. You know, it's what we're working with here. You ended up where whatever where it's a graduated one. Is it from twenty to thirty? Isn't it what we're doing? Um, Mostly twenty, twenty-five, and uh, thirty. Thirty. Yeah, it's a graduated. So your whatever percent mm -hmm. you take of that number, it's a pretty small behavioral incentive. Mm -hmm. I just want to point that out. Twenty, even if you would did twenty percent of twenty is four percent. Does someone's behavior respond to three and four percent of that? I mean, you're getting very, you're getting very precise with something that isn't precise in behavior. Now, I think that was the only caveats I had: the the twenty percent in the investment position, and the fact that overall the incentive is a much more modest one, than, as you can see, than the other ones we have in the chart. So, I helped or confused that with that thought. Sorry. I probably should let everybody know. <laughs> I was going to do this at the start. Yeah, I am. I am. I'm, 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 she just fine. did. She. I mean, she's <laughs> she's dreaming, and so she oh, made some. Nice. She made yeah. some. Yep. So Hopefully I am baby. I am dream. dog sitting for a friend of mine, uh, nice. her service dog, and she definitely distracted. I I thought for sure she was going to stand up and bark, but she's she's just dreaming and was making noise. So I apologize. So Jack, then let me ask you. Um, 
if if we were to start playing with these, um, and I and I think I agree that uh, the CFO ha definitely has uh, probably more weight into the total fund quantitative, and that the CEO with the long term strategic performance would, would be higher in the qualitative. So if we took a bit from the COO and put it into the long-term strategic, say maybe go 1040, how much does the, the CFO play into that long-term strategic planning? Oh, uh, quite, quite a bit. Quite a because bit. around risk management, all those functions are under the CFO. Oh, it's quite a bit, but a, a bit less than the COO. In fairness, just as Louise pointed out to you. Yeah, I thought it was a very fair comment. And I don't know if this is helpful if you're if you're going that route to um, differentiate the the quantitative, but you could look at the first option right. and assign that to the COO, and then option two to the CFO. Because that's that's how I would have. Thanks, yeah. Melissa. I was you just beat me to it. I was going to suggest those are good frameworks to to contrast the two. I thought too. If you all right, Harry. Well, thank you very much for that because I can now tear this up and it's right there in front of me <laughs> all along. Life's lesson number one. Sometimes it's right in front of you. Uh, so I would, uh, for the purpose of moving the item and for discussion, I'd like to make a motion that uh, the um, we separate these out and the COO incentive would be reflective of option one and the CFO would be option two as it appears in our agenda. All right, is there a second for the motion? Okay, it's been moved by Harry, seconded by Nora. We'll open that up discussion. Do you want to speak to that at all, Harry, any further? No, I think it's been flushed out quite nicely. Alrighty. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? All righty, we're going to put it up for a vote. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Any abstentions? The motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to item number four. Okay, so this is uh, a technical housekeeping item, and it's uh, introducing updates to the compensation policy, and these updates are all reflective of actions that have been taken by um, uh, this committee or the investment committee. So if you're okay, I can quickly walk through these changes with the committee uh, together. Um, we can go through it, and then... If you have any questions, we can just stop at each. Most of these updates to the um, policy and procedures are adding the COO and the CFO positions. So if you go to Comp 19, you'll notice that they're added into the Ed Code there. Comp 24, again, adding those two positions into the authority part. On Comp 28, we are um, adding the COO and the CFO uh, salary, base salary, as well as the increases that were um, adopted by the committee for the general counsel and the portfolio manager. And that was in April, correct? Correct. And then on Comp 29, you'll notice highlighted on that 0 to 10 percent, those are the increases that our CEO uh, generally um, provides annually. We have put a footnote uh, to be in compliance with the Ed Code for the COO and the CFO position, as well as um, another footnote that the committee adopted in April for the general counsel on the um, salary adjustment restrictions. On Comp 30, again, just adding in the positions of COO and CFO. On Comp 31 um, is the addition of the incentive opportunity for these two positions. And you'll note, asterisk, that the um, graded in is um, noted for those two positions. Uh, we now have a decision by the committee. So what staff will do is we'll go ahead and update Comp 33 and other related um, um, pieces in the procedures to reflect uh, the decision that was just made on the weightings. And then, almost, um, also on Comp 42, a partial um, payment um, was um, 
included four CEA positions who are then appointed to an incentive eligible position. Did you hit 38, page 38? I'm sorry, let me go back. And I'm sorry. Um, this will be updated to reflect the decision that just came out of um, item three. And then I think I highlighted the partial year award on comp 42. And then lastly, in all of the appendices, you'll notice uh, that we are incorporating the new fund codes uh, per the board's decision of excluding the non-controlled legacy assets from real estate. And then for innovation to include the reclassified assets and establishing the code for the RMS asset class. And those are updated in the appropriate appendices as well as in the, um, sorry, in comp um, 77 and 78 with the benchmark definitions. So that encompasses all of the updates. If you have any questions. I don't see any. Paul? So this is where I started <clears throat> getting my eyes glazed over on, <laughs> on all of these different um, uh, benchmarks and customized uh, uh, benchmarks for the different asset classes. And um, <clears throat> the, the concern I have is I wonder whether, whether we know that these benchmarks what the, the conversation that, that is now developing and that we'll, we'll particularly talk about this afternoon at investments with respect to the private equity benchmark is that, is that, is that we're defining, in that case, we're, we're, we're suggesting to define two, two separate benchmarks. Uh, one is a short-term benchmark, one is a long-term benchmark. Um, it seems to me we need to have a set of benchmarks that are all consistent with each other. So, for example, what I don't understand about these benchmarks, I, I, and I'd like to see that the analysis done, is, is if we, if we, if if every one of our asset classes performed as it was supposed to, would the benchmarks produce the the returns that that we say we're expecting to re to receive? In other words, would the benchmark for the whole portfolio show 7.4 percent? Would the bench would, because the benchmark here is defined not relative to what the board is saying we want. It's being defined as an aggregation of the individual benchmarks of the individual asset classes, and then the benchmarks of the individual asset classes are not driven by did the asset class achieve the 12.4 percent or whatever it is we're looking for in private equity, 8.6 percent we're looking for in, in global equity. But again, we're, we're trying to develop a proxy. And so my problem is I can't tell whether those are decent proxies. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you know, may, maybe Luis can do that. Maybe uh, Alan and, and Stephen can do that. Um, they are consultants to the board on compensation and investments, um, but that's my that's that's the concern I have because because our job as a board is 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 to get the returns so that we can pay pensions. Uh, our job as a board is not to spend our time focusing on the intricacies of benchmarks, which is one reason why I would like to just say. We should think about holding Chris accountable for getting 7.4 percent, mm -hmm. and give him a pot of money to pay his people with uh, to that end. And we get out of the benchmarking, the the detailed benchmarking decision and the detailed decision about 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 how to evaluate short term versus long term performance and things like that. So, not 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 the not the best formed question, but. Um, I, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it, I'm not confident I understand this enough to say that this is what the, the policy should be. Plus, 
Plus, this, what we're, asking, we're, we're being asked to do now, doesn't incorporate what we're being asked to do in investments to change the benchmark for private equity, right? No, that would come in July. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could, uh, an investment decision. You, you would bring in your benchmark of modifications again back in July into mm -hmm. the policy. Okay. So Depending on what you do. So this this would this is technical be. housekeeping yeah. today. Nothing, no change in policy, no change in approach. But if you change something substantial like that, it will affect going forward the performance period for uh, seventeen eighteen. Mm -hmm. If you bring it into the policy in July, in this committee. Did, does that make sense? No, I that I you know I I understand that. Okay. I, I I mean I. I, uh, and if I could add, and then you also have the parallel issue, which is the big question. I think your is fair to your comments. Is the board asked to be put on the agenda, really a step back on the incentive plan for this year, for seventeen eighteen in your work plan? And Luis is coming to your offsite. He is one of right. your yeah. people, to, not just for the committee, but I think we all thought twelve people should hear that. What is the best thinking around incentive structure? Yeah. So, I guess I see it as parallel tracks. You've got some housekeeping today. You've got a potential benchmark modification uh, that would affect immediately 17, 18. And then you've got the big question, do we have it right around incentive comp at all? And if you change that, that would be for 18, 19. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's, okay. I, I mean, I, then I'm, I'm comfortable w w with this, but it just raises a whole lot of questions, I and I'm really looking forward yeah. to that conversation. And, and Paul, the, the, I, I would just add one comment. This is, I, it looks excruciatingly detailed when you look at these charts and everything, but having done this a long time, um, I, I think it helps, one, we have an auditor that actually checks every incentive against the State Street reports, and they need, and they check these codes. And in the early years, you know, frankly, we, 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 there was some wiggle room we had to get right. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it, the Melissa staff is just wonderful, and they do this every year dead accurately. But this is meant so we have an audit trail of all what report is used for what calculation, so that we can be public about this, that we've checked these numbers, we, we've got them right. So there's a public transparency part to it, I guess. I don't have a problem. I don't have any question that we're that we're implementing the policy accurately. What my question is is this: we need our our policy needs to be one that creates incentives for investments to get what we want. The only thing we care about is. 7.4 percent with a with a defined volatility and 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 hopefully no huge drop in the in the, in the near term that's what we've said now now so so the question is do these detailed measures of benchmarks asset class by asset class are they are they in fact an incentive that gets us there or, or are they an incentive that 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 actually um, is inconsistent with that, and 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 so you know that that's my question, and um, and I think that that our investment consultants can can mm -hmm. help answer that. Chris can help answer that, but also Luis can help answer wh whether whether we should be micromanaging the 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 benchmarks at the asset class level or even the sub asset class level as we're now going to be asked to, into... to do on, on private equity. Yeah. Chris, go ahead. Um, to answer your question. And I think I can, with a high degree of confidence. So sorry for the comp committee, Chris Allman, chief investment officer for the plan. Um, say that, uh, both Alan and Makita would say, yes, these are consistent. The challenge and, and Paul, we've talked about it in the past 7.4, is an absolute threshold, and that's what we want. Um, but we can't control the economy. So you also use, that's an absolute return, and you, and you also use relative to figure out, to try and, and measure what value staff and the managers are providing. The relative returns are what we use for the incentive because they're good for a three and a five year measure. You know, the 7.4 is what we want to achieve over decades, all the time. Um, so in your policies, it says both absolute and relative. Um, we have always used relative, and Luis, I think, would say, use relative to measure staff over a three- and a five-year period, simply because we can't control the economy. And, and like you know, we set the asset allocation. 
Um, if your threshold was an absolute seven and a half um, and we didn't like the economy, we'd want to go to cash. And our plan doesn't allow that. We don't want to be that kind of active manager. So it's the problem is, and, and we've had this discussion at the investment committee, you, you want both. You want relative and absolute. To alleviate any concern, though, the benchmarks for all the asset classes um, are what drives those capital market assumptions, and therefore there should be in alignment. Year to year, obviously, we know they're not going to achieve what we think they, they should average, but the, hmm. the numbers that build up into seven and a half are based on what we think their long-term average is. Um, and Paul, obviously, you know the, the public markets were pretty darn exact. Global equity, fixed income. I would say even nowadays, real estate's pretty darn good. Um, the areas where we're always going to have a challenge is uh, private equity, uh, particularly infrastructure, um, those kind of private asset classes that don't mark to market very frequently. So then you don't really have a good relative measure. And, and one of the things that at the comp committee, because you still see all those appendices, the index codes that Jack's talking about, the investment committee would approve a concept, but then you guys have to approve these exact index codes. Um, and that's what makes it much more detailed. And you're right, the investment committee might approve something in concept at for the sub asset class, um, but then it, it gets down into the incentive structures and they are getting more complicated. We have dynamically weighted benchmarks when like inflation sensitive has public assets and private assets and the weightings change. So then we're trying to do dynamically weighted during the year. Straightforward for investment committee, but really complex in your appendices and comp. That's up to you guys. And Anything I, further? I Paul? caused the treasurer staff. Um, to, no, to I mean, I'm sorry. still <laughs> trying to understand this. I, I mean, I, 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 um, I, I know we're we're not we're not trying to measure absolute because that we're trying to we're trying to me measure relative if, yeah. uh, for 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 compensation I'm purposes. No, 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 no. I mean, and I know we're I know we're trying to do both. You know, uh, uh, but 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 my. My 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 question is a little bit different, and I, and I'm it's probably, you know, not going to get answered today. Um, but it's really the, does a does, are we choosing a relative benchmark that is actually though, you know, measuring the best that we can do towards getting where we want, which is our absolute return of seven point four percent. And you know, I, I don't know if we've had a year recently where we came very close to 7.4% for the year, but it would be interesting to know how our benchmarks looked in that year. <laughs> you know, in other words, in a, in a year when we got 7.4%, then our benchmarks should have gotten us to, seven, should be 7.4%, right? You know, it's an interesting question. I, and I, I have the returns for the fund back to 85, and I don't know, you know, like you know, the distribution of investment returns, particularly equities, is not a bell curve. So even though we pick seven and a half, it usually is below that or in the, in the hump of the curve, the median. The median is seven and a half, but the mode is probably closer to like 11. So that's probably, you know, I, I'm trying to think of the charts I have, and we can go back and look. I, I don't think there are many years where we actually hit I, I don't think so the either. average, and that's part of the, you know, the right. remember the distribution curve right. of equities, fixed income has an unusual distribution curve. And so I, it's hard to, it, we use an average, but it, life doesn't follow the average very often. And, and the things that, that Paul's talking about, we, I don't think we've ever really done an analysis like that, have we? I mean, it, we, I, You've done it backwards because, well, the, to me, you do it every time you do an asset allocation assumption. Because remember, right. the first big thing we do in the asset allocation assumption is approve capital market assumptions. The foundation of those are these benchmarks, are these benchmarks over history. And we're looking, and we talk a lot about the, the median, but then also we talk a little bit about the distribution. And that's where we realize, okay. Uh, so you do talk about this, but it's in a different context than this. Right. But that's why I said, I think with a high degree of confidence, I can say these add up. They are, in, they are consistent with your long-term um, uh, absolute threshold. Um, uh, year to year, 
like we're saying, it's it's going to be quite variable because okay. the standard deviation is 11 on, on a lot of the asset classes. All right. Great. Thank you. Eric? I'm going to uh, ask for some information to come back for the next meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. Um, I'd like to uh, see the for the past 10 years, so it would be three, I guess uh, if you looked at it in three columns, um, incentive pay pay to uh, for each year for the last 10 years to the CEO, which we do get, uh, the incentive pay for the CIO, and then the third column would be other incentive pay each year for the last 10 years. And um, I, I'm in agreement that this um, is excruciatingly complicated for me to navigate some of the details that are inside of this compensation uh, scheme. And we've done a remarkably great job of having the numbers checked and independently. And I'm confident, 100% confident, that we're doing we're implementing this exactly how it has to be done. And I remember a couple of years ago, there was a slight error, and it was adjusted properly. I would like for us to explore, is there a, more, a simpler way for us to deal with this? While not giving up our philosophy and our belief that we believe in incentive compensation, uh, the incentive compensation be, should be linked to total fund performance should be incentive compensation across asset classes, and there should be incentive compensation. I call it culture qualitative stuff. It's about culture. And is there a simpler way for us to do this? And I think a way to first get to figure that out is to, well, how much have we been paying incentive pay annually on an average basis? How big is that pot? And who should be determining how that pot is divvied up? Under what criteria? And then a recommendation is brought to us. This is how we're thinking of doing this. And we give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down, as opposed to how we're proceeding currently. Don't know if it's the right approach, but it, if we could simplify it, I'm in agreement. I think that's what Mr. Rosenstiel is asking for. And I think uh, that information might um, help guide us in determining whether or not it is. Thanks. I, I think that pretty much lays the foundation for what we want to take a look at coming forward, going forward in the in the work plan too, with with Luis. All right, Paul. And just if I could just add one more sure. column to that, which would be for each of those ten years, what was the investment return on our portfolio? Thank you. And so let me ask the committee. Um, we're asking, do we want this in a time certain, or do we want this to be just part of what we're going forward with throughout the the um, work we're going to be doing on the incentive plan? I, I think in a timely fashion, if we're going to make any sort of adjustments, it would have to happen during the 17, 18 year to be implemented for 18, 19. So right. something that's realistic. I don't want to, if it's... So it's not if there's not a rush on it. I no, mean, it no, can be part of what we're doing with the, within yeah, the work plan. Well, it seems to fold in well with what you're going to do. Yeah, I think. I think so too. All right. Yeah. All right, Harry, did you have any other further comments? All right. So we do have uh, this item up for uh, action. Melissa, we're done uh, going through the prog the yes proposal, right? Yep. All righty. Entertain a motion to approve. It's been moved by Nora. Nora seconded by Paul. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. Any abstentions? That item has passed. All righty. Uh, we do have the item that we've asked for under our review of information requests. And, and you understand what we're asking for? And you have it well in your notes? I do. Great. That's good, That's good enough. And then um, draft agenda. Um, I know that um, one of the things that we have, um, and Melissa, you might want to speak to this a little bit more, is um, within our incentive, we do have a trigger. Um, there seems to, well, in the, in, in the, we put in the trigger. Yes. We've not necessarily ever pulled it. We've had a lot of discussion over the trigger. Um, Maybe it's worthwhile taking a look at whether we want to continue having the trigger or not. 
And so, Melissa, do you want to expand on that a little bit? No, no I just, it were, uh, my understanding is um, if it, the committee would like to bring that in July as a discussion topic, the uh, investment performance impact on pay. Annually, the last few years, it has come before the committee uh, in the fall for um, consideration if the committee wants to take action, which uh, historically you haven't. Um, but we could definitely have a discussion about um, that part in the policy. We could do that in um, July. We could add it in July. If we took action in July, then it would take effect for 16, 17, correct? Mm, 17, 18, because we're already past 17, 18. Yeah. All right. And then if we, if we did it as part of our incentive review, then it would take effect in in eighteen nineteen, correct? Probably you wouldn't finish it till mm -hmm. till after the incentive yeah. decisions for this year, which would right. be in uh, September, October. September. Yeah. So so you'd want to think about that. Yeah. Sooner. So is the committee okay with having that on our agenda in July? Take a look at it. All right. Let's go right. ahead and add. That, I appreciate please, that. Please, it's sir. a it was a very complicated policy, and it's turned out not to be useful. And I think that's what we just wanted to check with you. Right. You if really we wanted want to continue that. Folks? <clears throat> yeah, it was we're taking up your time. With it's not affecting change. So. Right. All right. Thank you. All right. Is there anything uh, further that anyone would like to see on our draft agenda? That is before you. It's for information. Seeing none. Are there? Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak? Seeing none, we will say that the comp committee is adjourned. Paul, when do you want to start audits? Well, we have a lot of people who like our auditors and our committee consultants who need to arrive. So um, go ahead and stay with the original I, time. I think we need to stay with the original Alrighty. time unless we, we find that everybody's assembled early. And okay. Looks like audits will start approximately 10:15. Then, alrighty. Thank you.